Well, first of all, it's great to be with you, at least virtually. And I know this is going to be a fabulous convening of people all over the country who are doing the good work of redesigning our systems for whole child education. So I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone who's there, who's working in public education right now. It is God's work. And uh, we hope that this will be helpful in the community of learning that we're building together. And I am going to talk about what I think is the key agenda for this uh, effort that we're undertaking, which is creating schools in which children can really thrive and not just survive. Uh, I have personal interest. These are my two oldest grandchildren uh, who are coming into public education. They're just at that point of entering kindergarten, and there's a lot to do uh, before they get to um, middle and high school. This is the youngest grandchild who is, as you can see, learning to love himself. Uh, we hope that will continue as he moves through school. You've seen uh, this um, graphic in Jen's introduction uh, of what we mean by whole child education. Uh, and uh, we want to really be thinking about uh, how do we, what does that mean in terms of the kinds of supports that are needed? Uh, one of the things we know is that uh, a whole child education is really needed to develop uh, from the neuroscience that we're learning now, all of the neural networks that are the brain architecture, which are the foundation for intelligence. And so what uh, really enhances the development of those neural networks? Social interaction. Uh, we are social beings, um, and that is really uh, a key piece of it. Uh, rich environments for inquiry. Even in experiments, you know, with mice in different cages that have, you know, things to do and uh, barren landscapes, you see a difference in the intelligences that are being developed uh, by opportunities for stimulation and for inquiry. Physical activity matters. Music and art actually uh, develop uh, many of the neural connections. You know, they say what uh, fires together, wires together. Uh, languages, learning multiple languages. Uh, actually builds a neural networking that we rely on for many other things as well. Emotional well-being matters and cultural well-being, knowing that uh, who you are uh, is uh, accepted and um, uh, available, uh, enabling you to be a member of a community. Uh, and we also know what uh, impedes uh, the process of developing neural networks. And these are many of the kinds of things that we see uh, happening in uh, contexts where uh, children don't have um, the resources. Uh, it can be a function of trauma and stress. And we know so many of our children and our adults are experiencing that kind of trauma. It actually impedes the development of brain architecture, anxiety, loneliness. Uh, sleep and dietary uh, disruptions, toxins. A lot of our kids are growing up in environments uh, where there's a lot of toxins in the environment that actually have an impact on learning and development. Uh, identity threats, feeling that any of the identities you hold uh, are stigmatized, uh, as can be the case in both society and school. Race, um, immigration status, language background, disability status, uh, all of these things uh, really impede the development of brain architecture. And we also know in terms of principles from the science of learning and development that um, uh, learning is uh, social, emotional, and academic, that all of those areas uh, that you saw of development are interactive with one another. Uh, the brain is always developing, even at my age, it's still creating new capacities. Uh, based on relationships and experiences. And our job in schools is to create the relationships and the experiences that support uh, that kind of development. We know that children are actively constructing knowledge and it's all about connections. It's about connections between and among our experiences and what we're learning and ideas. Uh, and that inquiry is the process that jumpstarts thinking and uh, allows us to make those connections. Of course, we know that trauma affects learning, but relationships are key for healing as well as learning. And finally, that a child's best performance occurs under conditions of low threat and high support. 
in settings where they're accepted, respected, and enabled. So that's the task for schools. Uh, and yet, uh, we're um, in a context where it's very difficult to accomplish these things. A recent national survey of 6th through 12th graders found that only 29% felt that their school provided a caring, encouraging environment. Most did not feel there was an adult who knows them well in school. A recent survey from the School of Medicine found that 75% of high school students reported mostly negative feelings about school, and the most common adjectives were tired, stressed, and bored. And uh, this is not because teachers or principals or educators are not trying to make the environments they uh, work in uh, work for kids. Um, you know, it's a 20, whoops, a 20 year old um, infrastructure that is uh, based on the factory model, the old industrial model is radically ill-equipped for the challenges we have today. Uh, our present situation, says Joel Maida, calls for flexibility, relationship building, deep engagement with the broader world, but the school systems we inhabit are bureaucratic, transactional, and insular. The problem is not the people. The teachers are working heroically, principals, and uh, at all levels of the system. Students are persevering, in many cases, under very adverse circumstances, but they're working within a structure that is working against them. And so we think about the uh, issue of how we can use this time to support systemic change, uh, not just uh, add on special programs, uh, so that we're really organized for whole child thriving. The schools that we have that were designed, again, based on the assembly line model that Henry Ford had invented in industry uh, in the early 1900s were not designed to support relationships and whole child approaches. Uh, they weren't designed for deeper learning, personalized supports. Uh, they certainly weren't designed for equitable opportunity. And so we have to rethink uh, the structure of schools to get to whole child education. Uh, the um, Ellen Condiff Lagerman, who is a historian, uh, put it well when she noted that the system we inherited, uh, you know, was structured in a particular way because of the way the war of ideas worked out a, a century ago. She said, one cannot understand the history of education in the U.S. during the 20th century unless one realizes that E.L. Thorndike won and John Dewey lost. So uh, John Dewey, of course, was about child-centered education, around education connected to communities, around the whole child thriving of the sort that we're um, re-engaging today. E.L. Thorndike was uh, best known for his work in testing, um, and his uh, agenda was really defined by uh, creating the rules and regulations, the tests and requirements that would structure the factory model school. And so uh, we're having to re-engage uh, these issues uh, in a, a time that uh, a lot of the structures uh, need to be redesigned themselves. Uh, that factory model that was adopted was um, designed uh, in urban districts, especially to pass students along an efficient assembly line. We adopted the Prussian age grading system, which sends kids to a different teacher each year. The platoon system sends students in middle and high school to a different teacher every 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, teachers were uh, designed as individual workers on the assembly line to stamp students uh, with a lesson as they came through their classrooms. Uh, the idea of a standardized curriculum was invented and it was prescribed lots of time in motion studies to figure out exactly what you would do when. Uh, tracking was designed to create different conveyor belts really for students by race and class. And there was an explicit design for schools to be designed to select and sort rather than to develop talent. And you can look at some of the um, uh, writings of the time. Elwood Kerberly, I'm sorry to say, was Stanford uh, University Education School Dean, uh, noted uh, as he was uh, also a eugenicist that the new immigrants, uh, the Eastern European immigrants, uh, were not the same as the Northern Europeans, uh, didn't possess the Anglo-Teutonic conceptions of law, order, and government. Um, and he 
argued that city schools should be giving up the exceedingly democratic idea that all are equal and begin a specialization of educational effort. Uh, Pillsbury was a professor at uh, University of Michigan uh, who uh, took up that idea of specialization of educational effort uh, to argue that schools should take on the role of selecting and sorting the men of best intelligence from the deficient and mediocre. And the design was that uh, if, if um, some students were not succeeding, that they should drop out and go into the ranks of unskilled laborers, and others should go a little further and become the clerks, and a few should go on to universities. Uh, if kids weren't succeeding, there was no idea that we would design a school that could um, individually support them. And then you had the uh, invention of the IQ test by Lewis Terman, uh, who also was a eugenicist, uh, and he argued that uh, the 80% of the immigrants he tested were feeble-minded and that Indians, Mexicans, and Negroes should be segregated in special classes uh, so that they could be made efficient workers. So all of this is what fed in to the system we have today, and we're still trying to push our way out of it, trying to um, enable these structures to work in different ways. Uh, they don't intrinsically uh, allow students necessarily to be well known or well supported in many countries. Students stay with the same teachers for multiple years. Uh, they see fewer teachers overall. Uh, teachers are organized in teams to work together. Uh, they have time in their schedules, uh, usually on average about eight hours more per week to work with each other in collaborative groups, uh, whereas our teachers are still largely in the egg crate uh, classroom design that we inherited. Uh, we still have rigid pacing guides, which assume that students will learn the same thing at the same rate, which we know not to be true from our understanding of the learning process. Uh, we have had to focus often on more narrow tests that are not trying to evaluate powerful and engaging learning, but whether you can pick one answer out of five. Uh, often these are accompanied by punitive rules, uh, and we've seen how much student exclusion has been uh, for many years growing in the country. We're now trying to uh, work to find alternatives to um, kicking students out when they can't conform to the design. And then, of course, we have a lot of unequal treatment baked into the system. So that's what we're all working to try to evolve and re revise and reform. And meanwhile, as we know, the world has just changed dramatically. Uh, we're coming through a public health crisis. I just read today that there's another COVID surge in San Francisco, so we're not through it yet. Uh, an economic crisis, a climate crisis, a civil rights crisis, an education crisis. Uh, we're seeing the pandemic effects on health and mental health, uh, uh, high rates of childhood poverty. Food and housing insecurity are growing. So many sources of trauma mental health uh, related and family related. Uh, growing numbers of students are opting out of school. Parents are starting pods and homeschooling at higher rates when they don't find that the school uh, it can personalize to the extent that their uh, child uh, needs it. Uh, we have educator shortages and disruptions to just about every aspect of the status quo. And the good news is that these are the moments that often lead to major social changes. And we have people all over the country, including those of you in this room, who are really trying to bring uh, those changes into being, recognizing that, of course, you know, the demand for complex skills has been growing, even while uh, the skills that we teach and test are often the more routine skills that are easier to digitize and automate. We know that knowledge is growing exponentially. Uh, there was more new knowledge created between 1999 and 2003 than in the entire history of the world preceding. And knowledge is doubling faster than every year. So our kids are gonna work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet and technologies that haven't been invented yet to try to solve these massive problems we haven't been able to solve. I'm reminded of how much the world is changing uh, by a study that uh, colleagues at Google right up the street from me did some years ago, where they looked at what predicted success at Google, looking at all the transcripts and the grades and the test scores, and they found that none of those things 
predicted success at Google. Uh, what they felt ultimately was predictive was what they called learning ability. The ability to take an unstructured problem, figure out how to research it, work with colleagues to actually uh, develop or uh, design uh, an initiative, a solution, a problem, uh, to find and use resources, to plan and implement and revise that work on one's own, to self-manage, and to learn to learn. And that's not necessarily what our schools are structured to do, but it's what we are trying to accomplish within them. Uh, so reinventing school is part of whole child education, uh, which means focusing on authentic learning of the sort I just described and harnessing all the new knowledge we have about human development, learning, and effective teaching. Uh, we need schools that look a lot less like the individual students at their desks finishing their workshops, uh, their worksheets to, to turn in uh, with the um, uh, you know, anticipated answers filled in the blanks and more like uh, collaborative inquiry oriented classrooms where teachers are able to coach them into the kind of critical thinking that's needed. Uh, we need schools that produce much less stress and cortisol, which actually clouds the brain uh, when it floods uh, our systems and schools that support uh, the much more oxytocin, the hugging hormone that actually opens up our capacity to think and to learn and to feel safe. Uh, we need to think about uh, sort of a new three R's, if you will, uh, for schools where thriving is a goal, the schools that are relationship-centered and restorative, uh, as well as being responsive to children's interests and assets and ways of learning and their needs. So you've uh, seen this blue wheel before, and I know Jen talked about the fact that there are ways to structure schools that provide those positive developmental relationships and the environments that are filled with safety, the rich learning experiences, explicit attention to social and emotional skills and habits and mindsets, and then the supports that kids need to remove obstacles to learning. Uh, and there are areas of policy that you're working on uh, that are important to tap in order to do this because we can't just do this one school at a time and allow the mavericks and those who are willing to push against the system uh, to carry all the weight for designing a system that is really uh, organized around new principles. And I'm just gonna say a word about what some of the policy areas are that are so important as we uh, approach the whole child um, vision that each of you is holding and advancing in your state. Uh, to transform learning environments, we do need to support school redesigns that enable stronger relationships. Those might include things like looping where teachers and students stay together for longer periods of time. I will just note that the effects on achievement of looping are greater than the effects of reducing class size as they found out in the Tennessee class size experiment that's often cited. They had to take this, the uh, classrooms where the teachers had looped with the students out of the one part of the study because uh, the achievement effects of just having that knowledge base of the children and families and the continuity uh, was more um, powerful than reducing class size in the fragmented system we have. Advisory systems in middle and high schools where there's a small family group that uh, students can meet in, where they can do social and emotional learning, where they can share their needs with their a uh, teacher where they can get connected to other services that may be needed, where they can be advised and supported in their uh, pathways to college admissions and other aspects of what they're doing. Small learning communities where everyone is well known, teaching teams that get to plan together and have collaboration time. All those things require policy interventions at the district and the state level. Uh, we can, of course, adopt uh, explicitly social and emotional learning and restorative practices that uh, allow kids to feel a sense of community, uh, to learn to problem solve productively together. Uh, ultimately, that's not a distraction from learning. It's actually a huge contribution to achievement gains uh, because kids are so much more able to use all of their minds for learning and much less of it for the anxieties that they're otherwise trying to manage. 
Uh, community school models are taking off in many states and really providing a structure for those integrated supports and also for community connected learning. Uh, and then thinking about how to provide time for expanded learning that might include tutoring and small group work so that instead of tracking, we keep kids caught up with where uh, they um, want to be and need to be in their um, classrooms where we uh, break up the idea of 30 kids in a class or 25, whatever it might be, uh, as the only model for the learning um, environment. That's going to take creativity. It's going to take entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, to redesign curriculum, instruction, and assessments and accountability systems, we're really going to need to think about how to support more authentic systems of assessment that get at those critical thinking and problem solving skills more directly. Uh, ways through our curriculum choices at the state level and our, our professional development opportunities to promote experiential and inquiry oriented learning and then we need of course whole child accountability systems that include along with measures of learning measures of school climate of student engagement of student inclusion uh, college career and civic readiness family and community engagement uh, what we measure is what people pay attention to um, and so it's very important that we think about accountability as being a way to support continuous improvement around the things that matter. And of course, we always need to be thinking about building adult capacity and expertise that can happen in part through the way we design licensure and accreditation and preparation systems for teachers and principals and other educators, counselors, uh, so that the knowledge base about whole child learning and development is available to every person in every school, that this is not uh, a mystery to anyone. Uh, we then need to think about how to have continuity in the educator workforce through high retention strategies for recruiting and preparing folks, including things like residency models that solve shortages by deeply preparing people who are ready to stay in high need communities because they're so well prepared and well supported financially. Uh, the mentoring and induction that keep uh, beginning teachers becoming effective and staying, uh, the kinds of professional development and evaluation that infuse whole child practices. And I'll just note, I've looked at evaluation systems in countries around the world. It's amazing to me in how many countries, uh, things like supporting the whole child, supporting child development in all of the domains uh, that we started with are part of the way in which uh, teachers are developed and evaluated, that that's considered a part of the job. So we can build whole child values into everything we do uh, if we think about where it also supports adults in their learning and in their uh, own development. What happens when you put it all together? Uh, we've seen a lot of schools that have done this at the school level. We see states that are making headway towards making these kinds of practices available to more schools. We see uh, changes in the um, success rates of schools, uh, the, the achievement in the uh, ongoing uh, access to college and careers. Uh, and so we know that it's possible, uh, but we're going to need to really think systemically if we're going to have a different history for 21st century education than we had uh, in the last century. And I'll leave with the words uh, that many of you will recognize. This is, in fact, John Dewey. What the best and wisest parent wants for his or her child, that must the community want for all of its children. And I will add, that must the policymakers uh, construct a platform for, for all of the children. Uh, any other goal is narrow and unlovely acted upon, it destroys our democracy. It's only by being true to the full growth of all the individuals who make it up that society by any chance can be true to itself. And I just want to thank you for all that you are doing uh, to make this possible, uh, to set the standard, to provide the examples, and then to join together today in this learning experience.